Hey everybody, this video is called God Works Miracles and today we're continuing our pass through study here in the book of 2 Kings where we're going to be looking at God working miracles through his prophet Elisha. So chapter 4 verse 1 through 7 starts out, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather a just a few. And when you come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went with him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. And now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest so according to the mosaic law creditors they could enslave debtors and their children to work off a debt when they could not pay it back and you see that in the law of moses back in exodus chapter tw uh, 21 verse 2 through 4 and deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 12 through 18 and the period of servitude could last until the next year of jubilee which we looked at back in leviticus chapter 25 verse 39 and 40 and rich people and creditors however they were not to take advantage of the destitute according to deuteronomy chapter 15 and jar of oil was a flask of oil used to anoint the body and since the widow's need was private the provision was to be private also and further, the absence of Elisha demonstrated that the miracle happened only by God's power as God's power multiplied little into much, filling all the vessels to meet the, the, the widow's need, just as like the story of Elijah with the widow that we looked at back a couple weeks ago, back in 1 Kings 17. And Elisha told the woman to take what she had and to pour it out by faith into the borrowed vessels. And we see that this oil, it miraculously keeps pouring from the original vessel until all the borrowed vessels were filled. And the small vessel supernaturally filled again. And it's just like the principle that we talked about last week on Wednesday, I think it was, that our works determine the amount of blessing and the provision actually received. And God's powerful provision, it invites our put into it with our hard work and never, and it never excuses laziness. And verse 8 through 17 says, Now it came, or it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was no table woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by that he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned in the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, say now, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you now? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done to her for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son. Her husband 
is old. So he called, or he said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. And then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. So Shunem, it was a town in the territory of Issachar near Zezreel on the slopes of Mount Mora. And it overlooked the eastern end of the Jezreel Valley. And a notable woman was great in wealth and social prominence. And this woman recognized Elijah as a prophet, as a prophet uniquely separated unto God. And Elijah's holiness prompted the woman to ask her husband, can we, or, you know, shall we create a separate small walled upper room that we can provide for this prophet? And the woman must have feared the holy Elisha coming into contact with their profane room. And Gehazi is the unsaved servant in verse 43. And it was Elisha's personal servant who was prominent here. In the next chapter, verses 20 through 27, and throughout this narrative, Elisha contacted the Shunammite woman through Gehazi, as we're going to see throughout this chapter. And Gehazi was involved in the ministry that he might have the opportunity to mature in his service to the Lord. And in verse 13, it says, I dwell among my own people. And that reply expressed her contentment since she wanted nothing. And in verse 14, no son and her husband is old remark implied two things here, that she suffered the shame of being a barren woman as seen across many times in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 16, verse 1, Genesis 18, verse 10 through 15, Genesis 25, 21, and Genesis 30, verse 1 and 2, as well as 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6, which we went through in the fall time this past year, and we know that was Hannah's prayer. And in the Old Testament, the times of the Old Testament, it was considered a curse if a woman could not conceive and deliver children. And number two, her husband might die without a heir to carry on his name, which was also looked down upon in this time period in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 through 10. And in response here to Elisha's announcement that she would have a son, we see that the woman asked Elisha, you know, basically telling him, like, man, don't get my hopes up. I don't know if that can actually happen. It hasn't happened yet. How is that going to happen? And, you know, she, she was questioning him because she didn't want to be disappointed later. And her reply indicated that she felt having a son was impossible. In verse 17, it reminds us of what you might account in the story in the book of Genesis of Abraham and Sarah, as Sarah could not conceive a child, but God miraculously, uh, you know, gave her a child at the age of 90. And what a remarkable relationship we see witnessed here between Elisha and this Shunammite woman. And she sought to bless Elisha as the guest of her hospitality. And how much better would things be if we had more people like this Shunammite woman who was greeting others with hospitality and to serve others. And we see that her husband and her, they, they create a guest room for him. And as a result of her hospitality to God's servant, the prophet, we see that God is going to bless her beyond materialistic things. In verse 18 through 37 says, And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went to, out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, My head, my head. So he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. 
And she called to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run this man of God to the, uh, run him to the man of God and come back. And he said, Why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, It is well. Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forth. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And so it was that the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, It is well with you. It is well with your husband. It is well with the child. And she answered, It is well. And I want you to remember those words. It is well. And now she came to the man of God at the hill. She caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden from it from me and has not told me. So she said, Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was neither a voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was a child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child, and put his mouth on his mouth, and his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. And he returned and walked back and forth in the house, and again, and went up and stretched out on him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child's eyes, a child opened his eyes. And he said to Gehazi, and he called to Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. And then she picked up her son and went out. And what a amazing description and amazing miracle that we witness in this text here. And it is very questionable what this child uh, suffered. Um, we know from verse uh, 19, it says, And he said to his father, My head, my head. And many theologians agree uh, that this is most likely what they call sunstroke that this child experienced. And the cries of the boy, the part affected in the season of the year, like the reapers detail that we get, they lead to that conclusion. And sunstroke, obviously medical was not advanced like it was today. There wasn't as much knowledge of the impact of heat-related injuries at this time period. And sunstroke can be fatal as it was in this case. And many times in this time period, it was going to be fatal when there was sunstroke or what today we would probably call more like heat stroke. And the other medical conditions that could have taken place here could have been a brain aneurysm because brain aneurysms can, you know, go on undetected and erupt one day and take a life. I personally have had to deal with that ourselves. And then brain hemorrhage, uh, brain bleed. Uh, we don't know if there's details we didn't get where the, the boy got hurt, he hit his head or something, or even a brain aneurysm leads to brain bleed. And these verses, these are not easy verses for me to read, seeing a child with a head injury of some sort. Um, because as many of you know, it, it's a throwback to me to January 3rd, 2021, when we lost our son Aiden to a medical emergency with a brain aneurysm. And, you know, he was 10. And our other son, Noah, just turned 10 
on Sunday this week, you know, a couple days ago or yesterday, whatever. And it, it you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to explain and I'm just going to leave it at that. But, you know, when I read this passage here, it reminded me of that morning, you know, Aiden was complaining about his head, his head, and he was also, you know, starting to feel like he was going to get sick. We were actually on the way to get him, to bring him to the ER to get checked out for a really bad headache. And, you know, next thing I know, I'm on the phone with 911 because he's went unconscious. But uh, I feel for the Shunammite woman in this text that she was given this miraculous promise and reward for faithful service after being barren so long. And here is her son now dead on her lap. And, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that this story does not end here. This is an amazing story that we, we went through and it was a sad story but praise God that the story did not end with verse 20 21 22 and we see here that she had little faith at least not uh, she had little faith not talking about bur burial or funeral arrangements right away but her first reaction was you know what let's go see this prophet he prophesied this blessing into my life and now this blessing is gone and maybe just maybe this prophet who put this word on her maybe he can get you know the child to see a miracle and raise him from the dead and maybe she also had faith because she heard of the son of Zebrath's resurrection and she didn't want Elijah to learn of her grief through Gehazi and she wanted him to hear it from her own lips and to get a taste of how she was failing with a sense of her grief. And a Scottish Baptist preacher, Alexander McClarion, you probably never heard of him, but he made a commentary on his expositional of this book saying, Nothing makes grief dumb so surely as prying and yet indifferent intrusion. A tenderer hand than Gehazi's is needed to unlock the sad secret of that burdened beast. And when you lose a child, the grief is a burdened beast. And Elisha was surprised that God did not speak to him. And in verse 23, we know from the book of Numbers chapter 28, verse 9 through 15, that the first day of the month and the seventh day of the week were both marked with special religious observations or observances and rest from work. It was also the Sabbath. And the husband implied that these were the only such times that a person would visit a prophet. But she apparently concealed the death of the child from him, saying, It is well to spare him unnecessary grief in light of the power of the man of God whom she believed might do a miracle for her boy. And it makes me think of one of my hymn, favorite hymnals when I go through this text, where we see she, she said, It is well, in verse 26. It is well with the child, and she answered, it is well. And you probably know the, the hymn no, I'm talking about. It is called, It is Well With My Soul. And I will show mercy by not singing it to you today. But Horatio Spafford was the one who wrote this hymn no. And if you don't know the backstory behind why he wrote this hymn no, it was after many traumatic events in his life. And it all started with losing his four-year-old son in the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871, which cost him his business. It ruined him financially. Along with 1873, right after the fire, they had an economic downturn that made things even worse for him. And he was planning to travel to England with his family, with his family to help D.L. Moody's evangelistic campaigns but biz a business issue arose and he sent his family forward and he had to stay back to deal with that and the ship that his family was on it suddenly rapidly sunk or it collided i mean with a sea vessel and 
his four daughters that were with his wife did not make it. So now they have five children that have passed before their eyes. And his wife, you know, has to feel horrible because as a parent, you want to save your child no matter what is happening. You will lay down your life first, just like Jesus laid down his life for us. You know, you lay down your life for those that you love. And he penned these lyrics when he traveled over after this other tragedy with his four daughters being deceased. But uh, verse 27, the grasping of feet was a sign of humiliation and veneration. And Elisha sent Gehazi ahead because he was younger and therefore faster. And he may have expected the Lord to restore this child's life when his staff was placed upon him viewing that staff as representative of his own presence and a symbol of divine power. And Elijah in 1 Kings 17, verse 17 through 24, which we studied back approximately three weeks ago, Elijah demonstrated the Lord's power over death by raising their son from the dead. And also like Elijah, part of the restoration process involved lying on top of the boy's body. And so to continue on here, verse 38 through 41, and Elijah returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him and he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from a lapful of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. So he said, Then bring some flour, and he put it into the pot and said, Serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. So Gilgal was approximately 40 miles south of Shunem, and wild gourds were likely wild cucumber that were that would be fatally poisonous if eaten in large quantities. And the flour itself here did not make the toxic stew edible, but a miraculous cure was accomplished through the flour. And just like Elijah, Elisha used flour to demonstrate the concern. In verse 42 through 44, it says, Then a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread from the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley bread, and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, Give it to the people that I may eat. But his servant said, What? Shall I set this before one hundred men? And he said again, Give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some leftover according to the word of the Lord. And Baal Shalisha was a unknown location, and normally the first fruits were reserved for God, as seen in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 20, and the Levitical priest in Numbers chapter 18, verse 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 4. And, five. and though the religion in the northern kingdom was apostate, the man who brought the loaves to Elisha was a representative of the godly religion in Israel. And the multiplication of the loaves in accordance with the word of the Lord. And through the prophet anticipated the messianic ministry of Jesus, as we'll see here in just a few in our wrap up. And Elisha commanded that the small amount of bread be served to 100 men. And God promised to not only provide, but to provide beyond the immediate need. And Elisha trusted in the promise of God. He acted upon it and saw the promise miraculously fulfilled. And so today's wrap up, we look at a few miracles here involving through Elisha with the first being 
the provision for the widow. And we saw that she was a barren woman who, who was given a son. And we saw that the son died and was raised from the dead. And the significant difference here between the stretched out supplication of Elijah, Elijah and Elisha. And the authoritative command of Jesus raising the dead. And I want to look at John chapter 11 verse 43. And it says, Now he said these things. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And so Elijah and Elisha, they rightly begged God to raise the dead, whereas Jesus commanded the dead to be raised. And we looked at the miracles connected with the provisions of food, such as the purification of the stew. And the famine in verse 38 may be connected to the one that lasted seven years, as we'll look at next week in chapter 8. And there was nothing purifying in the flour that Elisha put into this pot. The real purification was a miraculous work of God. And we wrapped up chapter 4 here, looking at the multiplication of the loaves of bread of the first fruits. And I want to look at John chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. And many of you know this passage. And it's going to be very similar to Elisha's miracle involving the bread. In John chapter 6, it says, After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were dis diseased. And Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, were near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may be a little, have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has barely five uh, five barley loaves and two small fish. But where what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the people sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves and he had given thanks. He distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled the two baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men who had seen the sign that Jesus did said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. And therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So we see that Jesus performed this same miracle that Elisha, that God did through Elisha, but with 50 times more impact. You know, and when you look at Elisha's the miracle through Elisha involving the bread and Jesus, 50 times impact. You know, that's an amazing miracle that Jesus did in fulfillment to show that he was the Messiah. And that's going to wrap up this video. We'll see you next as we'll look at the leper named Naaman. So we'll see you next for Naaman. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening. God bless.